Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference. My name is Jessica Dalzell, and I'm with the Recycling and Sustainability Unit at Ohio EPA. I will be moderating today's session, Think Globally, Act Locally, Sustainability Solutions for Communities. The 2023 Sustainability Conference has 12 sessions over the next three days. Registration information and a conference agenda are located on the Ohio EPA's conference webpage, and we hope that you are able to join us for additional sessions. Please remember that it's never too late to sign up for the next session, and all of our sessions are being recorded to view later. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in this session. On this slide, you can see an example screenshot of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop on the right hand side of your screen. For this presentation, you are listening in using your computer audio. If you are having sound issues or if the slides stop advancing, please try refreshing your browser. If that does not work, try logging out of the session and logging back in. If you continue to have issues, please let us know in the questions pane and one of our behind the scenes team members will try to assist you. Please feel free to submit any questions that you might have to the presenters by clicking on the question mark icon and typing them into the questions pane. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation and either our behind the scenes staff will respond or our presenters will respond later. We will try our best to answer as they come in, but we will also have a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation today. If we do not get to your question during the question and answer portion, we will provide your questions to the presenters to follow up via email following today's session. You can also click on the document icon on your attendee interface to view a PDF file of the PowerPoint slides used for today's presentation. Again, this presentation is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and a follow up email along with a survey for the session. The survey will also appear once the session ends. We do value your feedback and would greatly appreciate if you could let us know how we are doing or let us know if there's anything else we can do to assist you. Now, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Each of our speakers represents a community that has been awarded a 2023 Gold Level Encouraging Environmental Excellence in Communities Award for their commitment and dedication to environmental, social, and economic sustainability within their communities. Up first, we will hear from Linda Arbogast from the city of Oberlin. Linda has been in her current position, which is the sustainability coordinator with the city of Oberlin for nearly five years. Linda is passionate about the environment and strives to make a planet that is sustainable for her children, as well as the other species with whom we share a world. The city of Oberlin, which is located in Lorain County, has a climate action plan that sets a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 100% by 2050 and operates numerous solar arrays on community facilities, in addition to providing programs like providing Oberlin with efficiency responsibly. The city also offers composting services to its residents, operates a class four compost facility, and provides a reimbursement to residents that purchase a composter for their home. The city of Oberlin utilizes an environmental dashboard to meter and display the use of electricity and water and the water quality in the local watershed. Next, we will hear from Elizabeth Elman, the Sustainability Programs Coordinator for the City of Bexley. Elizabeth implements forward-thinking programs and policies across multiple sectors of her community to inspire, innovate, educate, and create change. The City of Bexley, located in Franklin County, incorporated sustainability targets into the Community Master Plan, including a zero waste plan with a goal to reduce waste to landfill by 90% by 2040. Bexley offers curbside recycling and composting programs, as well as a waste diversion programming at each of their city hosted community events. Bexley is a soul smart bronze city and has enacted le legislation to ease the barrier of obtaining solar and allowing for PACE financing. Bexley also maintains solar arrays on several community facilities. Last but not least, we will hear from Meg Maloney, sustainability manager at the city of Dayton. In this role, Meg works as a project manager to advance sustainability initiatives to help decrease carbon emissions and save residents money. The city of Dayton, located in Montgomery County, operates a sustainability plan that includes 115 projects to make the city of Dayton and its residents more sustainable. These programs include electric aggregation to procure 100% renewable energy for all residents, 
creating energy efficiency programs for local businesses and installing a solar array at the city's drinking water facility. The city of Dayton prioritizes redevelopment of brownfield and Superfund sites, such as redeveloping the former Valley Crest landfill into a community solar farm. Now, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Linda, to share Oberlin's story with us. Good morning, everyone. A big thank you to Jessica and all of the Ohio EPA staff for the invitation to speak with you this morning. Uh, the city of Oberlin was founded in 1833, and we were founded as a college and community together. And I want to give you a little bit of history about Oberlin because it sets up why we're here where we are in our sustainability world today. The town and college founded in 1833. We were the first college to admit African Americans in 1835 and the first college to grant BAs to women in 1841. Oberlin College is the oldest coeducational liberal arts college in the United States. Our community was one of the last stops in the United States in the Underground Railroad, and we have a strong abolition, abolitionist history. Um, we have always been at least we've always seen ourselves as being on the cutting edge of social issues and climate action is similar in that for us. We have been doing sustainability work for about 20 years and our last climate action plan was updated in 2019. The work that we have been doing in the last five years has primarily been funded through what we have developed as a sustainable reserve fund. So first off, Oberlin owns its own municipal power grid. And our grid currently is about 85% made up from renewable sources. And by buying and selling on the renewable energy credit market, we generate income, which supports our sustainability projects. There was a debate in the community about what to do with that fund, with those funds, and some folks in our community felt that it should go back to ratepayers. So it was put on the ballot, and 80% of voters agreed that we should create the Office of Sustainability, hire a sustainability coordinator, and start funding sustainability projects that support the entire community. So I'm going to share with you some of the projects that we have funded over the past five years. So a group called POWER, it's a nonprofit organization that stands for providing Oberlin with efficiency responsibly, is a group that weatherizes homes in Oberlin. And the funding is based on a sliding scale of income, but every home in Oberlin is eligible to some degree. The funding that we give to this group also supports an energy advocate and a part-time administrator for the program. Power is run with a volunteer board, and their goal is to weatherize a minimum of 25 homes each year. Um, this year, I think we are in the 50 range already. Two years ago, we started the first publicly shared uh, all electric car share program in the state of Ohio, it's EV car share. And this program has been subsidized through the Sustainable Reserve Fund. Um, we work with a group called Sway Mobility, and our funding enabled us to lower the deductible. Um, one really challenging part of starting a car share program is the insurance. Um, so the funding that the city had was it, we were able to lower that deductible to make it reasonable um, because accidents happen. We offer this, these cars, there are now four in our community for $8 an hour. It's a phone on your app. And um, we carefully placed these throughout our town and made sure that they were walkable or bikeable throughout our community and especially to the folks who live in the lowest income parts of our town. 
there was some question early on, would, would this program be accessible and usable by low-income people? Would people of color use it? Or was this just for college students? Currently, of the top five users of this program, four are residents of Oberlin and low-income people of color. So we were happy to see that the program is used widely. We've also started last year a community composting program. There are four drop-off sites throughout our community. And um, as you can see, the, the bins that you see here, we have four of these stations throughout our city so that it's easily accessible. You are given a free kitchen caddy, and then you can come to one of the four locations to dump your compost. People are really excited about this program. Um, there is the possibility to have it picked up at your house for a fee, but otherwise it is free to everyone. In addition to being able to dump your compost or your food waste, it comes back as compost um, to you for free. So we have some bulk giveaways where you can come and get truckloads of compost for your garden twice a year. And then on a regular basis, we have 20 pound bags and you're eligible to get four of those free per year. We are um, working on this and we hope to develop uh, our own class two facility in Oberlin in the coming years. Um, I think you've heard about Overland's environmental dashboard, and we're very excited about this. We have 26 locations throughout our community. Some of those are, as you see here, at elementary schools. Some of them are located at community spaces, grocery stores, libraries, and many city buildings. Um, it is important to us that we use these dashboards to share information community-wide. We want them to foster a sense of connectedness and belonging. We want individual decision-making in the community context to be displayed on our dashboards. We want to share our pro-environmental thoughts and actions. We want to share our goals, our climate action goals on the dashboards. Here's some visuals about all that the dashboard offers. Um, we have newly a phone application where if you have a, you download the app on your phone, you're able to go up to one of the dashboards and see, perhaps you wanna see the community calendar and you can go to that. If you wanna see the citywide dashboard, you're able to see certain buildings and the energy that they're using. Oh, sorry. Here is an example of the dashboard showing you the energy use on a given moment in our community. You can see what, how much electric we're using, the water that we're using, and on the right, you can see it in, in real time. Um, and this is actually a, a moving picture. Sorry. Manage natural landscapes. So we updated our ordinance in 2021 because we feel like it's really important that everyone in our community understand their role in supporting biodiversity. Everyone has, well, most people have a yard and if you have any green space at all, you can promote biodiversity on it. We wanted to not only allow this in our ordinance, but we wanted to help people know how to do it. So, um, we had several community trainings where we uh, had helped people understand how to turn turf into managed natural landscapes. And we also gave out free native plants for their yards. Um, we do have a five foot setback requirement so that tall uh, native plants tend to be taller than the typical lawn so that for safety reasons, and we, did, we do give people a list of invasive plants to make it clear that there are certain invasive plants that we really don't want you to put in your yard. The newest program that we started just this year is called Mo Electric. This is a rebate program so that if you buy an electric leaf blower, string trimmer, electric lawnmower, and submit your receipts to the sustainability office, um, and also you must sign a pledge that you will scrap the gas version of this item you will receive gift cards to be used in local businesses. Um, 
all of almost all of our local businesses su subscribe to this so you can use it at the grocery store the hardware store downtown restaurants and businesses so in addition to reducing emissions reducing noise in our community you're also supporting local businesses now this program wasn't funded by the city it was funded through a student group at oberlin college so much thanks to them and it, it has uh, really gotten a lot of excitement in the community and i wanted to share with you um our over our, our electric company is called oberlin municipal light and power so it's omlps and this is the transition of our electric grid. So in 2007, we were still 72% relying on coal. By 2018, you'll see that that changed significantly. And by 2022, here we here is our most recent electric grid where um, only 16% of our grid is market rate which means it comes from nu some nuclear coal oil natural gas and a little bit of renewable and we do purchase offsets for that so that we can have a hundred percent grid and we work with amp ohio on this and they have been a great support to us in helping us purchase these contracts over the years we are we are actually looking at ending some of the landfill contracts this year so we're now working with them to decide how we will fill those with um continuing our renewable grid commitment. And this is a, um, a glimpse of our emissions reductions over the years. Um, so yeah, we have started in pretty much in, in 2007, um, but we use 2012 as our baseline because we're using the same methodology from 2012. So we wanna make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So our latest greenhouse gas inventory was done in 2021. So you'll see we've come down about 50% since 2012. And to make our goal of by 2030, um, we have a little bit of a ways to go. Um, we expect to get there. And climate action going forward. So um, we are coming up to updating our 2019 plan in 2024. Um, if you've seen our plan and you are able to see it on our website, on the sustainability page of the City of Oberlin's website, um, please take a look at that. It's an extensive plan. Uh, I think at this point we are going to assess where we're at with our goals in that plan and update that plan as opposed to doing a whole overhaul of the plan. We will continue to electrify transportation. We will continue to retrofit buildings uh, to be cooled with heat pumps, geothermal, VRF systems, and continue to focus on renewable energy in our electric grid with AMP Ohio's support. Uh, we're also looking to create more locally sourced renewable energy as a form of resilience. Uh, we are looking to start a, a solar array on our capped landfill, hopefully in the coming year. So that is a glimpse of what we're doing here in Oberlin, and I am really um, excited to be here today and happy to answer any questions now, but you can also reach out to me at any point, and here is all my contact information. And thank you again to Ohio EPA. Thank you, Linda. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to input them in the questions pane and we will get to those at the end. I will now hand it over to Elizabeth, who's going to cover sustainability in Bexley. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am Elizabeth and I am representing the city of Bexley, Ohio. Um, and in this session, we're looking to think big, even if we are not able to act big right now. But I think that we all do best when we can learn from each other. And so I just want to take a moment to learn from you. And I'd appreciate it if in the chat, you can put in like the coolest or most sustainable or most inspirational or most quirky sustainability action you've done in the last month or so um, because I want to hear what you guys are doing um, in either your personal life or in your communities too. So like here's mine that I thought of. The other day I made hair gel out of flax seeds 
that um, I did drive to the store to get them, but they were package free. But then I used those flax seeds and I put them in pancakes and then I ate them with maple syrup. And like, you are the people that I can tell this to, but despite being so proud of this, there probably are a few other people that I could tell this to. So take this moment to share with all of us in the chat some of the cool things that you guys have done um, in your communities or in your life being sustainable. So um, this is an overview of what I'll be discussing today. I hope this is helpful to allow you to plan um, those strategic bathroom breaks or moments when you want to zone out. So I'll give you like the little Bexley 101 and then I'm going to talk about some of the cool things that we do here, namely our trees and um, the army of children that I'm spreading my propaganda to. I'll give a brief overview about the one and a half million pounds of food waste that we've recycled in our city. And I'll ask if you've ever felt like a plastic bag. And then I'll talk about our mandated business recycling before um, wrapping up. So I am Elizabeth and I work for the city of Bexley, Ohio. We're a small suburb of Columbus. We're located on the east side. And I work as the sustainability programs coordinator for the city of Bexley. So my role focuses on managing the sustainability programs that we have, implementing new things, then doing outreach and engagement with um, the community members, stakeholders, and peer communities, as well as learning, so I can know what's up and coming and what things we should bring to Bexley. And what's really cool about my job is that I can act in two capacities. So one of them is like be your professional city employee where like I do the daily grind and people come into city hall and I talk to them and all that stuff. And then the other thing that I do that's really cool is outreach to a variety of groups and people on behalf of the city and the city's Environmental Sustainability Advisory Committee. We call that the ESAC. And colloquially together, we call those um, outreach branch of that Green Bexley. And so because I wear two hats, I can, you know, play the environmental card sometimes. So like I could be um, putting together a presentation one day but if tomorrow i want to come in birkenstocks and then i get like side glances i can just remind everyone that i'm an environmentalist and we should all be more crunchy or in the summer i planted tomatoes outside of city hall knowing that this would give me an opportunity to get away from my desk every so often so that i can keep them watered or if i ever get into hr and they tell me that i'm on thin ice i can let them know that yes we are all on thin ice because you know climate change so it's a really fun job, but I'm finding that there aren't many people in communities like Bexley that have a position position similar to this. And if um, you have someone like me in your community, I'd love for you to let me know. And if that's you, please message me um, your email address because I would love to get in touch with you. Now, a little bit about Bexley is that we are two and a half square miles. So we're kind of small with 4,400 homes and about 14,000 residents. Um, and we pride ourselves in our educational um, opportunities, the Bexley City School District, District, Capital University, and two private schools called CSG and St. Charles. We are a small landlocked city, but we try to pack a punch. And we aim to please and make it our mission to offer the best to our residents and the people who visit here. Thankfully, we have a wonderful team of committed people um, to handle these first four bullet points. And I get to focus on the last bullet point, which is to protect, preserve, and enhance Bexley's natural and developed environment. And here is a list of the ways um, that I try to do that. So here are some policies, projects, and programs that we have. Um, some of them are italicized or maybe that didn't show up. Um, some of these programs are in progress, but they are what we are striving to do. And today I'm going to be talking about these highlighted ones, beginning with our status as an arboretum. So as of 2013, Bexley became the nation's first municipal arboretum. And we were, we were accredited by the Morton Register of Arboreta. Within the city limits, we have about 14,000 trees of uh, 130 species, and this includes trees both in people's yards and on the city's public parks and in the right-of-ways. We have a team of urban foresters who care for these trees. Um, and you can see 
um, the different types of trees on the image to our, the right. That is a screenshot of our tree plotter system. And there's also a volunteer group, um, the Tree and Public Garden Commission, and they are tasked with specifying which trees are planted on which streets. As of 2019, our tree canopy was about 39%. And in addition to the quantity of the coverage, we're proud of the many big and mature trees that we have here in Bexley. And um, also the education and outreach spearheaded by the Tree and Public Garden Commission to educate the residents about the trees in the Arboretum and how to care for them. So this includes plaques on various trees, activities during Arbor Month and legislation to protect the trees in addition to tapping our trees for maple syrup. According to our most recent greenhouse gas assessment, the tree canopy assessment, um, our trees sequester a little bit over 2000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. And this um, is roughly 2% of Bexley's gross emissions. And what's really exciting is that 2023 has been deemed the year of the parks. And that is a um, series of enhancements to our park system. It includes signage updates. We got a dog park and a splash pad this year. And I've been asked to share with you the official verbiage to describe the project because we wanna make sure we get our money's worth out of the PR team we hire to promote this. So what I want you to do now is close your eyes and imagine yourself in your favorite park. And here's what it says. And while this project is about parks, green spaces and natural beauty, it's really about us about parks as a canvas to, to nurture and grow communities and to strengthen our connections within and around our neighborhoods. Okay, you can open your eyes. And so if you are interested in more information about our Arboretum, you can visit the website at bexleyarboretum.org. Um, and you can also get a behind the scenes look at maintaining the green spaces on the Instagram page at Bexley Arboretum. Now, this is an exciting slide, but unfortunately, I have lied to you. It says elementary education, and I had to submit these slides about a week and a half ago. But since then, this program has expanded to seventh graders, which I am very excited about. So a little bit of a backstory and an explanation to this program is, despite the fact that I like to toot my own horn, I know that I cannot recycle enough to get us all out of this mess. Um, I cannot fix all the world's problems by myself and I really do need people to help me do it. Um, even if I you know, make things illegal or incentivize people to participate in different programs, unless they actively participate, nothing is going to happen. And so the more people I get passionate about sustainability, the less work I have to do because I think that teamwork makes the dream work. Um, so I decided to find audiences that were built in and I didn't have to you know, promote and there were people who were gonna be forced to listen to me. Um, and I realized that the impressionable youth would be a great audience because one, it's the future, their future that we're talking about. And two, hopefully they'll go home and they will get their siblings and their parents on board. And so I tried really, really hard to get myself um, into the school system and to, to let these kids know what was up. For um, other reasons, including like that way I didn't have to deal with the school board and the administration so much because it's hard to say no to a bunch of passionate kids. So pre-pandemic, um, I was giving a few presentations to the elementary school students at two of the schools and then the Rona came and I thought this was going to be the perfect time to get my way in the schools. The parents were upset that the kids didn't have enough homework. So I created these hands-on learning activities that the kids could do at home. And I was like, guys, this is it. You know, I've, I've solved the, my problems. I've gotten everyone to participate. And lo and behold, there were very few kids that participated. So then I geared up for the next year and even fewer kids participated. Um, but then school was back in session. And so I had reached out to some of the fourth grade teachers that I had been in touch with before. And I offered to come to her class for a half an hour every month so that she could take a potty break. And she took me up on the offer as well as the other two fourth grade classes at her school. And I came in and we, we had fun with those kids for um, a half an hour every month at all three of those classes in that elementary school. And then by mid-year, I had roped in one of the other elementary schools and started seeing their fourth grade as well. And this year I'm excited 
that I am at all three elementary schools. So I reach about 180 fourth graders every month. Each week or each month we talk about um, a different sustainability topic. So if this year is anything like the last year, here are the things that I think are gonna go over really well. Um, the possibility of bananas as we know them going into extinction, cows giving off greenhouse gases from both the front and the back ends, and the variety of pollinators involved in creating an ice cream sundae. Um, and so anyways, now I think there are plans for me to hang out with the middle schoolers too. And I am willing to subject myself to spending a day each month with almost 200 teenagers, which I'm hoping is a lot more fun than what it sounds like. So I ask that you please keep me in your thoughts and prayers. Um, with this group, my goal is to channel their angst and present the way sustainability intersects with all of the causes that they are passionate about. And while I don't anticipate that these kiddos are gonna write me such nice messages as the fourth graders did last year, um, I hope that it goes well. And these messages are nice to look at when I'm feeling down because like the ocean is on fire or something like that. And then we have our food waste recycling program. And I have a few videos to share with you. So I'm gonna allow our tech team to take over and get those to play. One of our most beloved programs is Bexley's Curbside Food Waste Recycling Program. Each week, about 1,500 households place their food waste and other compostable items in these repurposed five-gallon pickle buckets inside a bag like this. Each Monday, the bag and its contents get removed and turned into plant fertilizer, and a new bag is left so the process can repeat. In addition to the curbside program, we keep toters on hand at City Hall to allow for overflow of material. In fact, we also sell 55-gallon compostable bags for residents to use when corn and watermelon are in stock at the farmer's market or when there's a big party happening. These are especially popular in the summertime. In fact, we also have one local hair salon that brings us their hair scraps. Happy composting! So um, as you can see, we are really proud of our curbside food waste recycling program. And um, we have about 40% of homes signed up. So they just put their material in that bag. The bag goes out in the bucket on Monday mornings. The haulers take the bag and, um, and put it in with a new bag. Um, and then the process starts all over. So to date, um, we are proud to say that we've had one and a half million pounds of food waste and compostable items have gone through this program since the pilot program began in 2017. And that number actually doesn't include 2018 because we unfortunately don't have statistics for 2018. Um, and we are also proud to offer um, this TOTER program to various organizations and businesses. We will cover the cost of weekly TOTER service for one receptacle for one year um, and after that time, the organization can decide if they wanna continue the service uh, and pay the cost for that. Right now it's $15 a week. We just had a local synagogue pick us up on this offer and we've had two restaurants formally participate as well as one condo that continues the service. Last year, we also had a group of passionate middle schoolers and high schoolers do a one week pilot program at their school and in attempts to convince the administration to make this a staple at their lunch. And what I really love about this program is that it is a meaningful step. Like people say to me like, Elizabeth, I'm doing it. Um, they do keep food out of the landfill, which is a huge deal. And people can see the changes in their reduction of trash. They feel like they're going out of their comfort zone because maybe they they grew up, you know, putting the food right in, in the trash can. Um, so they've tried something new and they feel really good about it. But I want what I wanna make sure um, doesn't get lost is that reducing food waste is the most important thing that we can do in this realm. So while I would love for more people to participate, I actually want uh, the individual household contributions to decrease. So just the things that can't be eaten, like your peels, pits, and your rinds are those things that go in your bucket instead of things like, let's use a paper towel because we can put it in our bucket, or it's okay that we let this big thing of pasta go bad because it can go in our bucket. 
I also want to say that participants can receive compost um, in the spring. And this fall, we will have the truck be doing two rounds of household pumpkin collections for those homes that participate in the program. The next thing I'd like to talk about is our single use plastic bag ban. And this in some ways actually relates to our food waste recycling program. So you might be thinking to yourself, Elizabeth, I thought that the state banned the ban, which is true, and I'll get to that a little bit in a minute. Um, so we were so excited for this ordinance and this program to take place. And um, we started on January 1st, 2020. There was a lot of hoopla and positive press. Um, we even had these cool take a bag, leave a bag containers made that we put in the Giant Eagle and the CVS. Um, so that way if people had extra bags, they could leave them there and people would be able to take them when they are purchasing their goods. And we also had, um, an, in our ordinance, we had a mandated fee of 10 cents for when someone was using a paper bag. And so what the ban on the ban really was is that the state said we couldn't have mandated this fee. So anyway, that has come into effect for a little bit because we started January 1, 2020, and things were going so well. And we did really well for about two and a half months. And then COVID came and the mayor um, told me that we were going to be pausing. And um, I took some time to recuperate and take a lot of deep breaths. But what we did was we used that pause to retool our ordinance and to incorporate the, um, the state's new mandates. Um, and then we relaunched when we were ready to do so. Now, our ordinance was also written in addition to um, paper bag, or I'm sorry, in addition to banning plastic bags at the point of purchase, the ordinance was written to phase out non-recyclable and non-composable food serviceware like takeout containers. Unfortunately, due to the cost of these types of materials and the supply chain issues and the difficulties restaurants were facing um, when we were supposed to incorporate this part of the ordinance, that part never really got off the ground. And that being said, there are still many restaurants that have a portion of their takeout materials are compostable. We feel really comfortable with this. We know that compostables aren't that great if they go to the landfill, but because so many people um, have our white buckets and utilize our curbside food waste recycling program, uh, which can take BPI certified material, all of that stuff can go right in there. Um, given um, the information that I have now, I really am hoping that we can look into some reusable systems instead of single use things, but it remains to be seen what our next step will be. And the picture on the very right is me with the big piece of cardboard and signatures of people who have vowed to use um, reusable bags at the store instead of single use bags. Um, I'm sure there are many other people who, who do the same thing, but these were the signatures we were able to get. And then the last program I wanna highlight is one um, that has not yet launched yet, and I am in the throes of putting together right now. We're calling this universal recycling. And in essence, what we're doing is requiring all commercial multifamily and institutional facilities to have a recycling contract. Bexley Homes began recycling on October 29th, 1990, and it's time for everyone else to get on board now. Um, we've negotiated what we think is a pretty good contract with Rumkey for various different types of receptacles. And this is dependent on the property size and uh, the type, whether it's you know a commercial building or if it's an apartment building. Right now I'm working on establishing a point of contact at all of these places and determining what type of, and size um, of receptacle they're gonna have and how we're gonna educate employees or visitors or residents um, to implement this. And please invite me back next year so I can give you an update on how it's going. And as I said before, this is not a one woman show and there's a lovely dedicated group of passionate volunteers on the ESAC who are working on sustainability projects throughout the city. Um, and as well as doing outreach under the Green Bexley name. Um, here they are with some guests in last year's 4th of July parade. And in addition to people bringing these ideas, we need people to spread the ideas. And what's so great about this group is that these people do both. They bring their own passion so that together we have a more holistic program. Um, and so in addition to these folks, we also need residents and business owners and teachers and everyone who's here in Bexley to partake in some sort of action, which brings me to my final point is that we 
would be happy um, for you to partake with us. So this October, Green Bexley is gonna be participating in the Drawdown Eco Challenge. It's a worldwide online competition that rewards you with points for all the cool sustainable actions you take. And it's really fun to participate, um, especially motivating for people who are competitive. And basically you sign up for different actions like bringing a reusable bag um, for as many days as possible during the month of, of October you check in and report that you've done that action. And it really is like very short and sweet and you can do it in the time that you take a bathroom break during the day. Um, and if you are interested in joining the Green Bexley team, we would love to have you just click on the QR code and ask that you commit um, to checking in at least 20 days of the month. And with that, thank you guys so much. Please be in touch and I appreciate all your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And as a reminder, most of you are already putting in questions, but feel free to keep submitting those in the question pane. And next up, we are going to have Meg from the city of Dayton sharing their story with us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Meg Maloney, and I am the sustainability manager at the city of Dayton. And today I'm going to be talking about our various climate initiatives that we are working on. So first, before I even go into talking about our sustainability plan, I like to kind of give a quick background on Dayton, Ohio. Um, sustainability is a way to alleviate socioeconomic stresses, and our sustainability plan is really catered to address some of the chronic issues that we're facing in Dayton, Ohio. So to kind of give you an understanding of why we did the projects that we did, I wanted to get, go through a quick background of some of the things um, that we're working through in Dayton. Um, so to begin, we had a peak population in 1962, um, and ever since then, we've had a decrease in population, so around 140,000 people now as of the most recent census, um, but that is a loss, a, a great loss of over 100,000 um, since 1962, and that is mostly attributed to the loss of manufacturing jobs and um, the sprawling of suburbs around the Dayton region. The Dayton region is actually pretty stable in population, so it's maintained the same population throughout um, since 1960s, but we have lost our population. Uh, the second thing I like to highlight is the um, historic redlining that happened within the city of Dayton limits. Um, so 40% of the city of Dayton population is minorities, uh, but 99% of our African-American population lives on the west side of the city. Um, and that was due to a lot of um, racist practices that happened um, in the 1920s, to the 1960s. And so a lot of our sustainability plan is trying to address equity issues that were due to some of the historic redlining and disinvestment that happened during that time. Uh, the other issue that we have associated with a declining population is a lot of vacant lots. So the city maintains, I think, well over 2,000 vacant lots throughout the city limits. Um, but this also provides a unique opportunity for the city of Dayton to do some creative sustainability projects on the vacant lots. We obviously see more vacant lots in the west side of the city. Um, that's where we have um, the greatest loss of population. Um, but uh, yes, it gives us a, a, an interesting opportunity to do some really cool sustainability projects with these lots. In addition, um, we are really proud of being a manufacturing city. Um, Dayton at one point had the most patents per capita. So we have created a lot of really amazing things within city limits, um, like the Cheez-It and the Ice Cube Maker, um, the self-starting engine. And so we had a lot of manufacturing jobs and still do, um, but due to a lot of the practices of um, eliminating waste, uh, manufacturing waste in the 1960s, a lot of these sites turned into brownfield and super fund sites. Um, that means that there's a lot of contamination still that we are working on reusing those sites, but you can see a lot of those um, brownfield and Superfund sites, which are the green dots, are located in a lower income neighborhoods. Um, so that is again, a big area that the sustainability office is working on is our Superfund and brownfield remediation, especially in our low income neighborhoods. Uh, in addition, we have been working on increasing our tree canopy. Um, so, uh, usually, actually, you see less tree canopy in minority neighborhoods. We kind of have the opposite effect um, due to our rivers that flow through the city. Um, and so we actually have stronger tree canopy, but I like to say not all trees are equal. So a lot of the tree canopy in city limits are invasive species like honeysuckle or calorie pear. Um, so the city has also, we've been doing some really cool sustainability projects to not only increase our tree canopy, but make sure that we have a lot of beautiful parks and urban spaces that our residents can use. 
Um, and lastly, I'd just like to highlight that um, the city of Dayton, a third of our residents um, live in poverty, which is the map on the left. And the map on the right shows food deserts within the city of Dayton. So something that our office also has been addressing is how can we do sustainability programs that's not going to be a financial burden on residents or can help alleviate some of the financial burdens on residents. Um, so I'll be talking about that today, along with some of the a little bit about some of the food work that we're doing. That's mostly a lot of our food equity work is done um, through our partners at Montgomery County. Um, so moving on to lastly, um, in addition to socioeconomic stresses, we have big change in climate. You all know this because a lot of you or probably all of you are from Ohio. Um, so here's a very interesting map that was put together by the University of Michigan showing like what our seasons are going to be like with climate change. Um, so we're going to have hotter, drier summers and then colder uh, or warmer winters. Um, so people don't complain as much about the winters as they do um, the summers being hotter and drier. Um, so taking all these kind of vulnerabilities, uh, the Sustainability Office put together this vulnerability index, which highlights priority neighborhoods. So any of the neighborhoods you see in red are neighborhoods that our Sustainability Office is focusing on. Um, the neighborhoods in yellow, it kind of looks a little bad on this map, so my apologies, but the yellow areas are our second priority neighborhood and our green neighborhoods are our third priority neighborhoods. Again, this was based on a GIS analysis of putting together like over uh, 30 different um, indicators that helped us understand which neighborhoods were kind of the most in need of assistance. Um, so that is a quick background on our socioeconomic, stre uh, socioeconomic stresses. And again, our strategy is really formed of how can we alleviate those issues within the city. Um, so when we first put together our sustainability strategy, which was adopted in 2020, we had five um, key areas that all of our projects touch. So climate mitigation, infrastructure, resilience, economic development, and most important, importantly, equity. And the idea is that anytime we start a sustainability project within city limits, we have to be doing something within each of these areas. So we have to help mitigate the climate through carbon uh, pollution reduction, through um, either emissions or um, improving the overall environment, ensuring that we're not having um, infrastructure, aging infrastructure issues or placing infrastructure in that's gonna be hard to maintain, that we're creating a more resilient system, that we're building the system to be more resilient, uh, a, a big misinformation about um, sustainability is that sustainability harms economic development. So we always like to highlight the ways that our programs are helping with economic development and most importantly, equity. So how are we alleviating, alleviating um, uh, equity issues within the city limits? So today I'm just going to talk about a couple of our strategy or our projects because we have over 115 that we adopted. Um, so I'm going to be focusing today on our renewable energy um, strategies and then also what we have been doing within our climate emergency that we declared. So um, in addition to our sustainability strategy, we did declare a climate emergency in 2021. Um, if you are from a municipal government, I recommend doing the same. We were only the second city to Athens being the first to declare climate emergency and this helped us set more benchmarks um, to reduce our climate emissions. So the first thing that we've been working on is putting a um, solar array on our wastewater um, or on our um, water treatment facility. So we had a um, brownfield site located next to our water treatment facility, and we're actually putting around five um, megawatts of solar. So we have an RFP out right now to do that. Um, we did this analysis in partnership with Go Sustainable Energy. So what we found is that due to capacity and transmission charges, we don't want to max out the size of the solar array based on the kilowatt hours that we use because that would actually increase the cost of energy that we're paying for. So go to this analysis to find the right size of solar that we need to get the maximum amount of savings for the city. So about 30% of our site's electrical use will be offset through solar. And we're expecting now around a 230 to $250,000 in savings from this project every year. In addition, I've been talking a little bit earlier about the Superfund site. So Superfund is a US EPA designation. Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, we have the most Superfund sites in the state of Ohio located in city limits. So we have the most, um, we have four active Superfund sites. Three of them are all located in the same um, area, which is our greater Old North Dayton area. Um, and so we have been working to alleviate this environmental injustice with various renewable energy projects. Um, so what we actually have been doing is we have on the first site, which I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. 
Um, on our Valley Crest landfill site, we are actually, it's a hundred acre site that we are putting solar on and we are going to offset um, electric bills for the residents living in the area so that they will have cheaper electricity helping with the environmental injustice caused by property values decreasing from the landfill. Um, the second project that we've been working on, we've been trying to um, secure grant funding. So this is definitely still in the works is you can see this big bear Dayton plume. So that is a uh, caused by a chemical called TCE and it leaches into um, people's households and can cause um, can cause an increase of cancer risk. And so it's a vapor issue. So what we do is um, the responsible parties installed mitigation systems, which helps clean the air of their houses. Unfortunately, they have to pay an increased price of electricity anywhere from $100 to $300 per household each year. Um, so we're working on securing grant dollars to put solar on their houses to offset their ventilation systems um, in order to yeah, correct kind of this environmental injustice that they're facing through having to run these ventilation systems to help keep their homes safe. Um, and then lastly, the Valley Pike site, we are still doing a lot of outreach. It has a similar issue to the Bear Dayton site. So we're trying to do outreach to just get ventilation, ventilation systems installed in households. It's our most recent um, Superfund site in the Dayton area. And then another really exciting project that we're working on is this thing called Renewable Natural Gas. Gas. So all of our wastewater treatment plants or all wastewater treatment plants produce methane. Methane is around 50% of all of our carbon emissions within the city of Dayton facilities. So we are actually capturing all of that methane gas and injecting it into our natural gas pipeline. This will reduce our carbon emissions by 50% for city of Dayton facilities and generate one to $3 million in revenue annually. So we are very excited about this project. Um, the next thing that we've been working on that we also declared is our um, electric vehicle goal. So we adopted an EV charging plan. And so the first thing that we've been doing is trying to convert our fleet to 100% electric um, by 2035. So we've been doing kind of a twofold um, process with that. The first is we conducted a fleet analysis. So we looked at which vehicles could we replace right now with electric um, to save money. And so what we found is that over close to 200 vehicles in our fleet can be replaced right now, save the city on average per vehicle. It was like over $2,000 a year. Um, so we have been working with departments to buy EVs. We have currently some Chevy Volts. Um, we also are working on getting some Ford Lightnings as well. Um, the second thing that we have been doing is also looking at charging because we need charging not only for our vehicles, but for the public as well. Um, so we are currently working with AES on, which is our utility, on a charging assessment. Um, and then we're also looking at putting charging out into the public. We've been working with our partners at SOPEC they're the Sustainable Ohio Public Energy Council. They're our city's aggregators. They are amazing partners and they've been helping us with also looking at securing dollars to expand um, EV charging, especially in um, communities that don't have EV chargers. And then one of my favorite things to talk about is I already keep them up a little bit, our work with the Sustainable Ohio Public Energy Council. So um, we restarted our aggregation program as part of our sustainability plan. Um, so we buy 100% renewable energy for all of our residents. Um, most of this, uh, in the past year, most of this has actually been wind, um, but in years past, it's been hydro. Um, we saved, in 2022, we saved the average resident $350 off their electric bill, which is huge, especially in a low-income community. That goes a, a very long way. Um, and then this past year, we saved $150 compared to what they would be paying if they didn't shop at all or were on the um, standard or if they were on the standard service offer with the utility. So total savings for the community has been 10.5 million in, in 2022 and around four to 5 million in 2023. Um, so that has been really amazing. And again, it's 100% renewable energy. So it has decreased our emissions by 2 million metric tons, which we are very proud of. And it's due to all the great work that we've been doing with SOPEC. Um, another thing I want to add, this is one of my favorite things that I get to do in my job, is our Dayton Sprouts program. Um, so actually, my first year at the city, I wrote a grant in partnership um, with the University of Dayton, um, Sarah Richard, and we secured $50,000 from the U.S. Conference of Mayors to create sustainability curriculum. Um, the curriculum is equivalent to a fourth grade Ohio State science standards. 
And um, each summer we have a summer camp program called Urban Adventures, and we offer an hour of sustainability curriculum for all the students within that program. Each summer we get around 300 kids that participated. We've been doing this program now for three years. So we've had over, um, now we've had 900, so I should correct this slide. Um, because the summer just ended, but um, we also teach them how to garden. So we have gardens. We did inside gardens one year, but we've been doing outside gardens the past couple of years. Um, we've been teaching them cooking classes. So we take things from the gardens and we make pasta sauces and guacamole and all sorts of stuff with them. Um, we also bring in guest speakers to kind of teach them about different sustainability topics. And each week they get to learn about a new piece of sustainability curriculum. So this has been a very um, exciting thing. Our kids really, really love it. We get a lot of positive feedback from them. Um, and um, I should also mention that all the curriculum we wrote, we also wrote like work, um, a curriculum guide for teachers and you can use our worksheets that we created. That's all public. So if you're interested in getting our sustainability curriculum, we do it for ages like six through 12. You can email me and I can give you the facilitator's guide and um, the worksheets and activities that go with um, the program. So coming up in 2024, we have a lot of exciting things. We are working on our decarbonization plan. So we have a goal to be a, uh, as close to 100% renewable by 2050. Um, so to be carbon neutral by 2050. And so um, we are working on a decarbonization plan to see how we can get there. We're also revising our sustainability plan because we adopted it in 2020. Um, next year, we'll do our revisions and publish our new one in 2025. Um, with more community climate action components and community engagement. We've also been working on some neighborhoods um, developing their own climate action plans that are going to be tied into our neighborhood plans. Um, and we're doing a lot more outreach. So we have some very, very exciting things coming in 2024. And I just wanna do a couple highlights because um, our office has only been here since 2020. So we've accomplished a lot in the past um, three years, but if you're in a city and you want to start a sustainability program, here are some great highlights that we have and some reasons why that more cities should adopt sustainability programs. Um, the first thing I think that I always like to tell people is again, like we have saved so much money through our sustainability office. So aside from our aggregation program, the city of Dayton sustainability office has saved our city facilities $3.5 million in 2022. That was through um, energy efficiency work that was through hedging energy, so procuring energy in advance at a lower price, um, also procuring renewable energy. Um, we've been doing a lot of billing auditing, and so we've saved a total of $3.5 million, which was huge. Um, we've diverted over 2 million metric tons of CO2. That includes through our sustainability, um, through our um, procurement of energy through our facilities and through our aggregation program. Again, we saved 10.5 million in 2022 and over $4 million this year through electric aggregation for our residents, which is a direct savings that residents can see and they're very grateful for. Um, we provided our departments over $180,000 of free technical assistance through working with various partners throughout the state. I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about Power Clean Future Ohio. We are a Power Clean Future Ohio community. They have provided so much technical assistance to us, which has been really, really amazing for our sustainability program. Um, and we've been recognized um, through the state. We were recognized yesterday by the Ohio EPA, um, but also through the Ohio Mayor's Alliance, Power Clean Future Ohio for our sustainability work. So we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish um, in a short period of time. Oops. So the last thing I, I wanted to show, so I showed you that map in the beginning. Um, and essentially I wanted to show you kind of how our projects have broken up now. So anywhere there's a giant star is where we have done a sustainability project. So you can see a lot of our projects are in um, our priority neighborhoods, um, in those red and yellow neighborhoods, but we've also done some projects in our Belmont neighborhood, which is in a green neighborhood as well. But this has been a huge highlight as well to show that we are also investing in our historically disinvested neighborhoods, which is a huge um, purpose of our sustainability program. Um, and then just some quick lessons learned, again, if anyone's currently starting a sustainability program, thinking about it or wanting to do it even in an, in an organization. Um, we update our plan every couple of years with priority projects. Um, engagement from city departments is huge. So I, I work a lot on just working with people, getting people excited about the projects we're doing, showing them how we can help also elevate the work in their departments. Um, we like to also showcase how sustainability can save money, not only for city apartments, departments, but for residents and also small businesses. 
I also work a lot with our manufacturing community to help them with energy procurement and energy efficiency work. So overall, sustainability is a huge driver of financial savings, but also saving our planet with the decreased emissions. Um, what I've also learned is not everyone will be happy with all the sustainability work. We do always get pushback. Um, of people not understanding sustainability or getting misinformation. That's part of the job. That's why education is really important to help correct um, some of the misinformation that we get about the work that we're doing. Um, a, a huge part of our work is community engagement. So we do a lot of neighborhood outreach, working with our neighborhood partners, working with nonprofits within the city limits to also get their buy-in on a lot of our sustainability projects. And we would literally not be able to accomplish all the things we've been able to accomplish without their help. Um, tracking is a huge key. A lot of people ask like what we've been doing or are like, what is your office? Yeah, what does your office even do? So showing them through our different tracking mechanisms, how much money we saved, the projects that we're doing, the number of people that we've outreached to has been um, really instrumental. And lastly, um, don't take on too much at once. It's better to do something extremely well than do a million things mediocre. And uh, I think in sustainability, there's a lot of different projects that you can do when people get really excited. And so something that's been hard for me because I want to do all the sustainability projects is sometimes I do have to say no because if I can implement a program really well, that also brings in more buy-in. So don't take on too much at once, even though there's like so many things that, um, that you can be doing in the sustainability field. And... With that, that is my contact information. So again, if you want to learn about sustain our sustainability program, get any of our information from our Dayton Sprouts program, our curriculum, or just, yeah, learn about how, what we're doing and, and have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You can always email me. That's usually the best way to contact with me. And with that, I think I will throw it back over to the EPA staff to take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Meg. We're now going to have our presenters answer some of the questions that you all have been submitting throughout the presentation. Um, so a common one that we got, I'm going to ask of each of our presenters. Um, a lot of people are wondering how they, as a normal everyday citizen, can help improve sustainability in their community. So maybe starting with Linda, if you can just give us a quick blurb about the best, best way to be involved in Oberlin, and then um, Elizabeth and Meg, you as well. A uh, great question. Um, I think that attending council meetings is a great first step. It, it happens a lot that things get discussed and people feel left out of the conversation. And um, oftentimes it's as simple as learning when those council meetings uh, are being held, looking at the agenda and showing up. Um, I will speak for myself, but as a city employee, there is just nothing better than citizen engagement. And we all work for you all, and we want to know what you want. And we work hard to try to get that information. Um, you know, I, I offer myself to speak at civic groups, I speak at school groups, I speak at churches, I even offered living room conversations. Um, and that is so that I can hear from you all. But one standing away that you all can be a part of the conversation is to attend council meetings. Similarly to what Linda said, I, I think one of the best things that you can do is learn and then talk about it. Um, so get all this knowledge into your noggin and then tell other people what you know. Um, tell your friends who are already engaged and let them know your why and why this is important to you and why it's important that they also act and get involved with your local community. There are lots of places, um, at least in central Ohio, lots of municipalities that have citizen residential groups. Uh, there might be something similar where you are. So join them or start them and talk to your city government um, about ways that you can get involved or bring a new project to them. I don't have too much to add. I think um, Linda and Elizabeth covered that question well. Thank you all. Uh, next up, we have a question about um, if your community seeks any external funding to help implement the programs that you offer. Um, so another kind of general one, feel free to hop in if you have any input. Sure, I'll start. Oh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, Linda, you take it. <laughs> okay. Um, sure. Um, yes, obviously. We, you know, we can't do it all. Um, 
And one of our uh, partners is Oberlin College, and we often collaborate on funding opportunities. Uh, the college students at Oberlin College have a fund that funds sustainability and carbon reduction. Um, and so I'm often working together with them on that. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act has a multitude of opportunities, and I have a group of residents that I'm working with, and our plan is to form a team to really do a deep dive into the IRA so that people can call us and say, hey, I'm thinking of putting, you know, solar on my house. What are the opportunities for me? And, you know, that they're out there. It, it's just not that easy to navigate. And so we want to be that resource. So we're, we're working on that. And um, the Ohio EPA, actually, we're looking at asking for funding for our new compost facility. So, yes, we absolutely look for external funding as well. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. So we, our budget um, only pays, so we only have two sustainability staff in our office currently. Um, so, and we don't have any additional funding that comes in besides paying for the staff. So we get all the things that we have been doing has been securing through grant funding and through free technical assistance. Um, so the first great resource I want to highlight again is Power Clean Future Ohio. They have this um, great website that shows you all the different Inflation Reduction Act and infrastructure grant um, that are available. So I check their website like weekly to see what's coming down from the federal government and we have applied to um, several of those grants. I just wrote a tree grant. Um, an urban forestry grant with our public works department and we just won two million dollars last week to expand our tree canopy so a lot of those federal funds are really excellent um the second thing is yeah leaning on partners for some of the free technical assistance so like aes um, our utility did our fleet analysis for us for free as being part of the pilot program um sopec sustainable ohio public energy council has been great in also having funding to provide um resources for us to go after grant dollars, but also just um, to do various sustainability projects. So, um, and then lastly, I think uh, our office, we save a lot of money for the city. So I'll kind of show where savings are and try and advocate that some of that money comes to our office to do various projects. Um, but I can also put in the chat, um, Power Clean Future Ohio's federal assistance. Um, so you can kind of read through the various grants that are available and how you can apply to them. Elizabeth, did you have anything you'd want to add? Um, I wanted to echo Meg's comments about Power Clean Future Ohio. They are just phenomenal. Um, in the city, we rely a lot on the Bexley Community Foundation, um, and there are many generous donors who support our projects through that program. And also, I just want to push the, um, the local, the free assistance that you can get um, from your local university. So. We've had a few semesters worth of capstone students from the Ohio State University do some technical work for us, which has been really excellent. And also we just implemented um, our aggregation program. And with that, um, the Dynagy, um, who is going to be our energy supplier, will be giving us funds back. So there's a whole lot of creative things that you can do and, and ways to get money to fund these programs. Great, thank you all. Uh, next up, we had a question about how each of your communities pushes out education, such as what is or isn't compostable or recyclable in your community. Um, so if you could just quickly touch on how you put out your educational materials. All right, I'll jump in. So we are fortunate that we have a, a person whose job it is to do that, um, a recycling coordinator. And, you know, it is not easy, and I bet that's why you're asking, because uh, recycling is complicated, and it seems to be getting more complicated as our sources to take the recycled goods, you know, reduce. And, and my hope is that the United States will be better and start manufacturing items with recycled products more. Um, in, in Oberlin, we've actually, over the past few years, reduced significantly the amount that we're recycling. And one thing we're doing is we're buying a uh, glass crusher and we are going to restart our recycling of glass by um, taking all the glass and crushing it and using it in our own construction projects. So being more innovative. But your, your question was how to get the word out. Um, I think uh, 
Similar to composting, I have found that if you start in the schools with kids, they bring that information home. Um, it is certainly working to increase our rate of composting. And um, so we're doing both composting and recycling with kids in the schools, teaching them um, so that they bring that information home to their parents. I can jump in here. Um, we do a lot of social media advocacy through Green Bexley. Um, on Facebook and Instagram, and we also push out some of this information in quarterly newsletters, and the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio um, does a mailer every so often, as well as Rumpke, um, and we utilize those forums for, for many of um, our outreach, but specifically for recycling, I want to plug um, Feet on the Street, which is a program that we did at the end of 22. It was funded through the Ohio EPA, and it is a curbside recycling auditing program. Uh, residents were sent a mailer before the program began of what is and is not acceptable. And then for a few weeks in the fall, we had people go out and audit the recycling coders. And you got a warning if you had something in there that should not have been. And then the second week, if you had something still that should not have been, your toter wasn't picked up um, until the next week, assuming that you had fixed that issue, um, taken that material out of your toter. And so that was a really great way Again, that program is called Feet on the Street, and uh, it was financed through us, through the Ohio EPA, but is, it is a program that occurs uh, nationwide. And I'll just add to like our, I think being in like a lower income city is kind of unique because the traditional ways of getting information out like through social media or through like newspaper, things like that are not always our best way of, because uh, a lot of our residents like, just have a lot of things going on in their lives so it's hard for them to kind of stay on top of things so we have found that the best way for some of like our recycling information is just like we literally put like stickers on their cans um we have a huge community engagement staff at the city which has been really great um so they go we have neighborhood associations with neighborhood presidents so our community engagement staff go to every single neighborhood meeting um and so that has been a way to get information out but i just the only thing I wanted to add is it's it's very challenging for us um, to educate residents just because we have so many other issues going on in the city and you know residents have a, a lot of things on their plate. Um, so that is something that we've been kind of trying to work through creatively are like besides like social media, is there is there other opportunities for us to engage residents? I know our community engagement person department also like would ride on the bus and do education through like talking to people on the bus, which I thought was a really cool idea. So we've been trying to be a little bit more creative in some of our ways that we talk about our various just sustainability things, but also just more broadly, like what the city is working on as well. That's really neat, Meg. I love that idea. Um, we had a question come in about track, tracking software, excuse me. And Linda, I know that you talked about your dashboard. So maybe Meg and Elizabeth, um, if you can mention if your communities use any type of tracking software to track your waste, energy usage, et cetera. I can start. So um, we, this was a fun thing. We did not um, track any of our energy bills before. So we had over 700 electric accounts and 80 um, uh, gas accounts for the city. And so we recently just got a energy tracking software that tracks our natural gas and electric data, which also tracks our emissions and we can do emissions reporting through that. So that has been amazing. And um, we partnered with our energy supplier to get um, a pilot of that um, to see like if our staff would use it and like it. And so far it's been very successful. Um, water is the one thing that we're gonna work on next. The city is the one that like pumps and treats our water. So while we are trying to focus on it, it hasn't been as a bigger concern as much as electric and gas because our water bills are just like paid in house to ourselves. So uh, that's kind of our next phase that we're going to be working on, but why it hasn't been such a um, as much of a high priority. Mm -hmm. And then our last one for waste are, I should just say, we have an excellent waste manager here in the city of Dayton, John Parker. He's amazing. And John has been really great at working with um, Montgomery County Solid Waste to do um, our tracking of how much um, our residents are putting towards the landfill, but also like what our city um, facilities are generating. Um, so we don't have any formal tracking software for that, but we do have, um, they are pretty good about, they have this like master Excel sheet that we look at um, to track all of that data. And here in Bexley, we love a good spreadsheet. So that is uh, what we enjoy using. <laughs> Thanks Elizabeth, who doesn't love a good spreadsheet? 
Um, we had a lot of questions come in about how to ensure that you're getting resident and city council buy-in for your sustainability programs. Have any of you had any uh, struggles or hurdles that you've had to overcome to make sure that you're getting the buy-in you need? Hi, uh, Linda. The, yeah, obviously struggles. I mean, city council's job is to make sure it is something that residents want. Um, I think I mentioned this briefly in my presentation, but the EV car share program is an example of um, where, where council had a lot of questions about, you know, is this just going to be a young person, college student thing that we're supporting? And so why would we support it? So I was asked to do lots of things, community outreach events to discuss it, um, a community wide survey to see if people would use it. My pushback was a little bit like, you know, if people have never driven an electric car, it's, you know, they may, they may say no because of un being uncomfortable with it. And this is an opportunity to use a car where you wouldn't have a lot of investment. For $8, you have an opportunity to try this new technology. But in fact, the, the surveys did show that people were interested. So, so yep. Definitely push back in and in Oberlin and I'm guessing um, certainly in Dayton, the council wants to know that th the sustainability efforts are supporting them, those of the least economically advantaged in your community first. So, um, you know, weatherization was the first thing we funded with our with our sustainable reserve fund because that everyone felt clearly was going to support the low income community the most because it was done on a sliding scale. So I think um, in summary, we look at all of our projects through the lens of social justice and making sure that it will support all residents and making sure that low income people will be supported the most. Yeah, I can say the pushback we got. So I should start by saying our city manager and commission are excellent. They are so supportive of sustainability. All of our commissioners are very supportive of it. And our city manager, she has been very good at supporting our office and me and the various projects that we're working on. The biggest pushback we get is just some of the misinformation that I think everyone knows is happening around the state and the country. Um, so we get residents that are concerned about, um, we had like a solar project going in and we had a resident group that was concerned that solar would somehow be um, harmful to human health. Um, so we work really closely with our state partners to kind of combat some of that misinformation. The Ohio Department of Health did a really great assessment on if solar is harmful at all to human health. They found that it was not, um, but that research has been really helpful. Um, using our University of Dayton partners, they're currently doing some research on the ecological benefits, the holistic ecological benefits of like solar prairies and how um, those are can potentially be beneficial um, ecologically um, if you convert like a turf grass field to, to a solar array. Um, some of the other pushback we got initially when we adopted our plan was from the business community. And again, I think that was all misinformation. Um, our office was relatively new. Um, and I think that was honestly a lesson learned with us that maybe we should have just done more outreach and education um, because now I work very closely with a lot of the people that were initially against it. Um, because we've been able to help their businesses save money either through helping them secure rebates for energy efficiency or helping them think of a new energy procurement strategy so that they can save money on their bills. Um, so yeah, I would say residents and businesses were our first biggest ones, but again, it was just really due to misinformation. Um, and now it's more of just, I think some of the hurdles that we that we face are more on a policy level. So um, either you know with some of our renewable energy stuff like trying to get utilities to adopt more friendly policies that will allow us to do um you know community solar we still don't have any legislation um, there was legislation introduced but that hasn't been passed um by the ohio state legislature so that would be ideal so i think a lot of the barriers we face now are more kind of in the policy realm um that we yeah we just really need our our state um to help support some of the the initiatives that we're working on Elizabeth, would you like to add anything to that question? Yeah, one of the first things I did when I came on board was I presented um, to council at, at a retreat um, and I basically explained, you know, how the climate crisis is affecting them as Bexley residents and as Americans and how we are all at risk. Um, and I'm not sure how much that actually helped, but it was an attempt. We're very lucky that um, 
all of this is championed by the mayor and um, that council is very much on board with many of these things. That being said, um, sometimes uh, it does, there is a, some dialogue. Um, we currently have an anti-idling ordinance on the table, um, but what's exciting is that our council members are motivated um, by this kind of work and, and like to ask the questions um, and be thoughtful about what they implement so that uh, things are sustainable in terms of the environment, but also programs that we can keep and maintain. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, this question also can be for any and all of you. Uh, how are the sustainability programs in your community implemented um, or driven? Are they driven by residents? Are they created by staff, um, city council, et cetera? I'll start. Um, so in Oberlin, at least when I first started five years ago, we put out a big push to the community to say, what do you want? And here is the funding available. Here is the criteria to apply. And, you know, give us how much carbon you would reduce with your idea and how many people it would support. And then we would take that idea to council. That's how we started. And we did that um, up until COVID. So for several years. Um, and it resulted in a number of really cool projects. Uh, the EV car share program was started that way. The, um, we have a solar array that supports 85% of the electric needs of our new elementary school. It was started that way. So various projects in the community were started through a push out to the community to say, tell us your ideas. So now we, um, next year we'll be sort of starting over and again, being like, we are going to establish a new fund. We're going to have an updated climate action plan. We're going to push it out to the community again. I'm assuming, I mean, that's a council decision, but I'm expecting that that will be the case. Ours is a, is a combination of different things. So the ESAC, um, those volunteers, do implement um, some grassroots programming. We have a very popular uh, native planting um, and educational program that they put on in the spring. So the ESAC members work on their passion projects. Um, some of our legislation comes from city council as well as the mayor. So our universal recycling ordinance uh, came from a council member who uh, had lived in an apartment and didn't have the opportunity to, um, to recycle. And so that's where that came from. And then some of this uh, education stuff um, is my my thoughts. And then the mayor has some really grandiose ideas about energy um, reduction. So it is a collaboration here in Bexley. And I'll just add on it. And Dean, I think um, a lot of the ideas were when we first adopted our sustainability office was when we had community engagement, a lot of people were like, you know, I'm worried about my utility bills. I'm worried about, you know, having enough money to pay for, you know, food for my family. So something that we really wanted to do right off the bat was a lot of the energy work because we see direct savings not only to city council but to residents, right? And we can we can save money for city facilities that we can put back into neighborhoods, but then we can also save money on residential utility bills, which help alleviate some of the energy burden. So um, that was the feedback we got when we initially did our sustainability plan and doing community engagement work. We got a lot of feedback about just funding. So that's where we started. Um, and then, yes, I think similarly, a lot of the other programs that come about are usually resident pushed. So um, we've had um, some residents wanting to do managed natural landscapes. So we're adopting a managed natural landscapes um, guidebook and then also putting some language in our zoning code. So some of the projects like that, EVs was really resident driven. Um, so those kind of projects, I think, definitely come up from, from resident conversations. And if I could just add one more thing to this, um, our greenhouse gas inventory is also the sort of the baseline for where we need to reduce our emissions. And in Oberlin and likely many small communities, um, commercial and industrial gas use is one of the number one areas that we need to focus on so personally i'm looking at that and i'm thinking how can our funding help support that in the next five years as we look to our 2030 goal of 75 percent reduction we really need to start tackling that 
Great, thank you all. And thank you again to all of our presenters for being here today. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining and asking some great questions. Um, before we end our session, I would just like to point your attention to a couple of programs that Ohio EPA offers. Uh, first up, our Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award Program. And specifically, I would like to highlight our Encouraging Environmental Excellence in Communities category. Um, again, Dayton, Bexley, and Oberlin are all awardees of this category of the award program, which recognizes local governments for environmental stewardship commitments and practices. You can apply online. Um, our 2024 award cycle is open now and will close on April 30th of 2024. So plenty of time to get your application in. And next up, our recycling and litter prevention grants. Uh, we offer a yearly recycling grant program that supports communities, nonprofits, businesses, et cetera, to initiate or expand recycling programs, encourage sustainable practices, stimulate economic growth, and support litter prevention efforts. Applications are online and open on October 2nd, so that uh, open date is approaching quickly, and those applications will close on December 1st. You can visit RecycleOhio.gov for more information on the grant program. And then I would just like to highlight a couple of our upcoming sessions for the 2023 Sustainability Conference. You can join us later this afternoon to hear about federal funding opportunities being offered under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, also later today, we have a session on food waste reduction and diversion solutions. And then tomorrow morning, we will learn from members of the Ohio Materials Marketplace and the Ohio Byproducts Energy Network on how to participate in the circular economy in Ohio. Again, when we end this session today, you will receive a survey and we do value your feedback, so please fill it out if you have the opportunity. Uh, we also have recorded this webinar and you will receive a link to today's session. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and end the session and thank you all again for attending. Uh, we appreciate you being here.